Good afternoon, it's my great pleasure to uh, uh, share and launch this session, uh, which is, as you know, the second keynote lecture of our Version Subversion Conference, but is also uh, one of the lectures in an online series that we've called Close Relations, the uh, setups lectures on literature, uh, culture, theater, and translation. It's a series that allows us to benefit from insights brought to us by uh, major experts, renowned scholars, in a variety of areas across the humanities and social sciences. And today, uh, we've got the uh, privilege of having uh, with us uh, Michael Cronin, uh, one of the uh, uh, best known names in translation studies. Uh, he is the uh, 1776 professor of French uh, and the director of the Center for Literary and Cultural Translation in Trinity College, Dublin. Uh, his uh, publications are uh, broad ranging and numerous. Uh, they, uh, well, they range from Translating Ireland, Translation Languages and Identity published back in 1996. Uh, there was an, an emphasis on spatiality and uh, 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 mobility studies uh, through uh, books like uh, Across the Lines, Travel, Language, Translation, uh, also Translation and Globalization, these from respectively the year 2000 and 2003. Uh, a later uh, moment uh, in uh, Michael's career included also uh, an attention to uh, the variety of the media through a book such as Translation Goes to the Movies uh, and uh, the Digital Era. Uh, Translation in the Digital Age was precisely the title of a book that came out in 2013. In uh, even more recent years, uh, a particular attention to uh, uh, environmental concerns uh, also found their way very productively uh, into the uh, range of his publications uh, as shown by titles such as Eco-Translation, Translation and Ecology in the Age of the Anthropocene, uh, and his latest, which I believe is already out, is it, Michael? Eco-Travel, Journeying in the Age of the Anthropocene. Uh, Michael is a member of the Royal Irish Academy of the Academia Europea, also an officier in the Ordre des Palmes Académiques, uh, a fellow of Trinity College Dublin, and an honorary member of the Irish Translators and Interpreters uh, Association. Uh, today, he'll be addressing us on translation in a time of loss. Michael, thank you very much for so kindly accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Louis, for the micro wasn't on, uh, microphone. Um, so uh, thank you again for that very, very generous uh, introduction. Uh, one of the things that I didn't realize uh, when I came up with the, the title uh, of this lecture, uh, Translation in a Time of Loss, is that uh, TAP, the airline, uh, would lose my suitcase uh, uh, on the, uh, the way from Lisbon to, 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 to Porto. Um, so it seems as if sometimes uh, the power of language uh, is even more extraordinary than we think in terms of prefiguring uh, events that will, will happen. Um, but I want to begin uh, my lecture uh, in the year 1943. And the um, great uh, Hungarian uh, novelist, uh, Sándor Maroj, uh, has spent three months in bed uh, recovering from a viral uh, illness uh, in wartime Hungary. As the writer uh, makes his uh, slow recovery, he receives a copy uh, in the, uh, the post of the Czech translation uh, of his novel, uh, Chutra. He is horrified. Uh, Maroy is unable to read or understand Czech, but his attention uh, focuses on the cover uh, of the book. Um, it features a drawing that is supposed to represent the subject of the novel, his dog uh, Chutara, uh, which the Hungarian writer describes as, and I quote, a horror born out of the imagination uh, of the Czech illustrator who has drawn a kind of cross between a short-haired fox terrier and a toilet brush. 
Uh, Chutura, my dog, uh, was a magnificent German shepherd who might faithfully described from both the inside and the outside. Um, the canine uh, confusion makes Maroy doubt the ability of translators to get anything right. He says, in the hands of a translator, what remains in the imagination of others of what we write and think? What terrible misunderstanding is contained in every word that one human uses to address another? Although Maroy generalizes the fickleness of translation to all human communication, it is clear that translators are the immediate culprits, the frontline defenders of the indefensible. Maroy's doubts were hardly uh, new even then, and the tagline of loss has been endlessly recycled in the rhetoric of translation commentary. If poetry is allegedly what gets lost in translation, the topic of loss and translation rarely, if ever, is lost. Each time it is announced as if it is an unforgettable, incontrovertible truth. Translators variously uh, respond to these after-dinner platitudes with an eye roll, a shoulder shrug, mild irritation, or silent fury. Uh, one of the, uh, I think, uh, predecessors in the series of talks, uh, Lawrence Venuti, uh, in his uh, Contra uh, Instrumentalism, classes poetry plus translation equals loss as one of the, what he calls the proverbs of untranslatability, uh, where he sees uh, translation has always been subject uh, to the moralizing imperative of an instrumentalism uh, which sees translation as the mere uh, transfer of a semantic uh, invariant. Titles such as gained in translation uh, or found in translation constellate publications on translation as if wrong footing the expectation is enough to debunk it. But what if we were to take loss uh, seriously? What would come out of not losing sight of what loss actually uh, involves? What have we to lose in finding out what different kinds of losses, linguistic, cultural, ecological, have in common? And what if being a loser was not so much a label to be rejected as a condition to be explored? Being alive means experiencing loss. Um, the German writer uh, Judith Szalansky's terse assertion in the preface uh, to An Inventory of Losses from 2020 follows on from her discussion of a cemetery that was situated at the heart, not the periphery, not the edge, of a remote Danish fishing village. It is generally assumed in modernity that we do not like to be reminded of our losses. Our cemeteries are not found in our central plazas, at the heart of our cities. They used to be, but they no longer are. Uh, but on the outskirts uh, of our cities, the forgotten suburbs of the afterlife. The German writer asks the question, who is closer to life? And I quote, someone who is constantly reminded of their own mortality, or someone who manages to suppress all thought of it. By way of answer, she draws up her own inventory of losses, ranging from lost uh, islands and extinct species to the lost poems of Sappho, the incinerated scribblings of an eccentric, and the lost biography of an amateur astronomy, astronomer. An inventory of losses uh, uses the fine detail of what no longer is to explore the world of what might have been. Loss clarifies. We never cease finding out how much we have lost in what is arguably the most common experience of bereavement. Shalansky, however, uh, in describing the purpose of her book, does not see her writing as an elaborate kind of threnody, an elaborate lament uh, for the vanished grandeur of lost worlds, but as an urgent invitation to value uh, the present. This book, like all others, springs from the desire to have something survive, 
to bring the past into the present, to call to mind the forgotten, to give voice to the silenced and to mourn the lost. Writing cannot bring anything back, but it can enable everything to be experienced. Hence, this volume is as much about seeking as finding, as much about losing as gaining, and gives a sense that the difference between presence and absence is perhaps marginal as long as there is memory. It is memory which links large-scale stories of historical shift and destitution to micro-histories of individual loss. What gives these micro-histories their specific identity and contour is not so much what individuals have gone on to, the stories the obituaries tell us, but what they have left behind. Childhood, parents, homes, first loves, teeth, toys, favorite sweaters. What constitutes a life provisionally is what remains when all the rest is lost. Losses as much as our gains uh, define us. The French novelist and philosopher uh, Vincent uh, de la Croix uh, points out that the experience of loss cannot be reduced to the fey cameos of nostalgia, but is integral to what makes our sense of the world uh, intelligible. He says, what is lost is not at the edge or on the margins of our experience of the world, but is central to it and is everywhere because it is what makes it possible. What is lost needs to be represented, not as the object of nostalgic awareness, um, the, as the object of nostalgic awareness of ordinary memory, but as a condition uh, of experience. While the absence uh, of this condition, the impossibility of relating to the real from and through what has been lost, attest to the diminution or even the loss uh, of uh, experience. Loss, therefore, uh, from Delacroix's point of view, is foundational uh, and not marginal uh, and subtractive. Um, Borges uh, senses this in an essay he wrote in 1931 on the subject of Gustave Flaubert's style. Um, he was not persuaded uh, by the French master's uh, claim that perfection of style made his prose immortal. In fact, he believed only that which could be lost could be retrieved. Trying to stave off loss only made loss inevitable. The perfect page, the page on which no word could be altered without harm, is the most precarious of all. Changes in language erase uh, shades of uh, meaning, and the perfect page is precisely the one that consists of those delicate shades of meaning that are so easily worn away. On the contrary, the page that becomes immortal can traverse the fire of typographical errors, approximate uh, translations, and inattentive or erroneous readings without losing its soul in the process. So, Borges puts loss at the heart of Flaubert's stake on posterity. If loss is constitutive of our experience, if life cannot be imagined without loss, then if it follows that part of what makes a text live in translation is what it loses. If poetry does not get lost somewhere in the translation, then it is in trouble. The poetry, that is, not the translation. For the page to become immortal in translation, the question is not one of accepting with pained patience the entropic falling away of substance in moving from one language to another. Rather, embracing loss is a precondition uh, of translation that is alive in its partiality rather than stillborn in its completeness. Um, writing in his journal uh, in uh, 1849, the uh, Danish uh, philosopher uh, Søren Kierkegaard uh, indeed saw the uh, immortal uh, or more modestly the future posterity of his writing 
as dependent on two preconditions, translation and loss. And I think it's sort of appropriate that the soundtrack to my lecture is the sound of somebody who definitely is losing out in one way or the other uh, in the physical uh, sense of the word. But to go back uh, to uh, Kierkegaard uh, for uh, a moment, um, he says, oh, uh, someday after I am dead, fear and trembling, his great work, alone will be enough to immortalize my name as an author. Then it will be read and translated into foreign languages. People will shudder at the frightful emotion in this book. The Danish philosopher and theologian cannot see any viable notion uh, of the future without loss, unless one embraces faith in a divinity, and uh, I'll return to this uh, a little later. It is the approximate uh, translations that will ensure the posthumous fame of the frightful uh, emotion. The loss of his other works will ensure that this one is not lost. His reputation uh, entails loss, and it is the books that do not get translated, that are literally lost uh, without translation, that define how or for what uh, he will be uh, remembered. Thus, loss is less uh, a lack that needs to be remedied, uh, a criticism that needs to be endlessly uh, refuted in a defensive or uh, elegiac uh, mode, and more a dimension of translation which makes the practice integral to the business of leading a meaningful life. Witold uh, Gombrowicz uh, had in mind a, a particular kind of translation loss when he finished reading the French uh, translation uh, of uh, Joyce's uh, Ulysses. In a review he wrote for a uh, Warsaw uh, magazine, Courier Ponani, Parani, he expresses his admiration for Joyce's revolution of style but laments the fact that the translation in the Polish writer's second language uh, prevented more intimate uh, contact. And obviously, we prefer to have read this in English rather than in translation. And he concludes on a sort of a note uh, of exasperation. It is annoying to know that someone over there abroad, a previously unknown method of feeling, of thinking, and of writing, has been born whose existence renders our methods completely anachronistic. And to tell oneself that only purely technical obstacles can prevent us from having a deep knowledge of many new inventions. So Gombrowicz has found something in the French uh, translation, in which, of course, as we saw earlier, uh, Joyce had a hand, but it's not enough. He feels he's missing out because the purely technical obstacles of language difference have made him hungry for more. But the fact that the, tr the French translation has failed to whet his appetite means that the obstacles cannot be purely uh, technical. If they were, they would require simply technical uh, solutions, and these are obviously not forthcoming. Gombrowicz is impatient to have a deep knowledge uh, of many new inventions because he fears these innovations will make what he does uh, obsolete. For this anxiety to make sense, however, we must recognize that the Polish uh, writer is a creature in time and like all humans uh, mortal. If he could live forever, he would have world enough and time to learn English or wait for a better translation to emerge. He knows and so do we uh, now know, because he's no longer with us, that his time is finite. He cares about translation, knowing that time is scarce uh, and that he may lose all those things which Joyce's text might teach him as a writer in time. The Swedish writer uh, Martin uh, Higland, uh, in his book, uh, This Life, uh, Why Mortality Makes Us Free, offers us a frame not only for parsing, if you like, the anxieties of uh, Gombrowicz, but also for understanding why translation needs loss 
to function as a meaningful practice. In his work, Hagland uh, seeks to understand uh, or seeks to define what he calls secular faith in opposition to uh, religious faith. He says, secular faith is the form of faith that we all sustain in caring for someone uh, or something that is vulnerable to loss. We all care for ourselves, for others, uh, for the world in which we find ourselves, and care is inseparable from the risk of loss. Knowing that we are finite beings means that we are aware of the fact that everything we cherish may one day be lost. This awareness does not make us despair, but makes us care for what we value and makes us sustain its presence to the best of our abilities. Caring for someone or something only makes sense in a finite world where the loved one or thing may die or disappear. In an eternal life, none of our actions would matter because none of them would be irreversible and would thus be devoid of consequences. Finite time checks any course of action, ruling out certain futures because you've chosen others, so what you do uh, matters. A secular faith is committed to the flourishing of finite life, and this should ideally include uh, all forms of finite life on the planet as an end in itself. I quote, if the earth itself is the, an object of care in our time of ecological uh, crisis, it is because we've come to believe that it is a resource that can be exhausted, an ecosystem that can be damaged and uh, destroyed. If the planet were eternal, there'll be no need to worry. However, the knowledge of the irreparable damage we have caused and continue uh, to cause makes the continued existence uh, of the human species on the planet uh, an open question, so that we are, in principle, compelled to care and assume responsibility. When the Cameroonian uh, theorist uh, Achille Membe argues in the middle uh, of the recent COVID uh, pandemic that, and I quote, we must answer here and now for our life on Earth with others, and our shared uh, faith, he knows, like all mortal be beings, that time is running out. For Hagland, the attraction uh, of uh, religious as opposed to secular faith for believers is that it promises a release from the risk of mortality, from the certainty of loss. He says, I define as religious any ideal of being dissolved from the pain of loss. So the Christian notion uh, of salvation, the Buddhist concept uh, of uh, nirvana, promises an entry into a world beyond human cycles uh, of birth and perishing. Even the Stoic promise uh, of detachment from mere mortality as humans, uh, except that their regeneration in the material processes of the cosmos is designed to preempt loss in a particular way. Detachment, not attachment, is the watchword. The eternal promise is the dissolution of loss. In eternity, it is not only loss which is dissolved, but also care, responsibility, value, and meaning, which means that we should beware what we wish for in translation. When Vladimir uh, Nabokov uh, declares that the person who desires to turn a literary masterpiece into another language has only one duty to perform, and this is to reproduce with absolute exactitude the whole text and nothing uh, but the text, his faith in translation is unmistakably religious. He strives after a translation that, in Hegelund's uh, words, is dissolved from the pain of loss. Nabokov is not saying anything startling here, if anything, he is articulating a truism. The poetry that gets mislaid in the translation is the popular sign of the translator's fallen condition. Loss, however, can only be removed in the realm of the eternal. From the standpoint of secular uh, fate, and I quote from Egmont again, continued fidelity to someone or something is inseparable from the apprehension of loss. The risk of loss is the motivational force 
of secular faith. Is the sense that the translator is grappling with something in finite uh, time that makes the task so vital. Uh, she will not be around forever uh, to do it so that every effort must be made to capture each nuance and scruple in the finite time available. However, it is precisely the necessity uh, of loss uh, that drives the struggle against loss. In secular faith, attachment is always risky. The object of attachment can leave or die or perish. Um, the risk is unavoidable, which means that all reasonable uh, efforts must be made to sustain the well-being of the object for which you care and are responsible. Love is born out of loss, uh, ennui out of eternity. The Czech uh, writer and artist uh, Adolf uh, Hofmeister, on a trip to Paris in 1939, uh, asked James Joyce for permission to translate um, this section of Finnegan's Wake, uh, Anna Livia uh, Plurabel. Uh, Joyce's advice to the young translator was to, and I quote, to poeticize it with the greatest poetic freedom you can give it. And he says, and to create a language for your country according to my image. Um, Victor uh, Lona, this is um, another uh, translator in transition, posited the thesis, language can be made by a writer, in this case also by a, a translator. So Joyce's invitation to Hofmeister implicitly evokes um, what Hegelund sees as the three conditions uh, of secular faith, what he calls existential commitment, necessary uncertainty, uh, and uh, motivational uh, force. Let me begin with existential uh, commitment. Existential commitment is constituted by the uh, commitment to a fragile form of, of life. And this is present in the very nature of Hofmeister's assignment. Hofmeister, as a mortal being, will produce a translation at a particular moment in finite time. Walter Benjamin is intensely aware of this existential commitment when he describes the shelf life of translation itself. Benjamin says, while a poet's words endure in his own uh, language, even the greatest translation is destined to become part of the growth of its own language and to perish with its uh, renewal. So if the translator is gifted uh, with the special mission of watching over the nurturing process of the original language and the birth pangs uh, of its own, the commitment to translate is all the more real because of the ever-present possibilities uh, of the loss of the text to the language if it is not translated and of potential redundancy even if it is. This dual spectre of loss is an encouragement to try harder, uh, or in Beckett's, Samuel Beckett's famous words in Westward Ho, to uh, fail uh, better. The necessary uncertainty, this second kind of precondition uh, of uh, Hegelund's uh, secular faith, comes from being committed to someone or something, um, which means that I must have faith in the future and on those on whom uh, I depend. I cannot know for sure how the future will turn out uh, or what others will do, so I must uh, relate to both on the basis uh, of faith. The risk is always the betrayal uh, or the unexpected. As Hofmeister does his translation, he can never be sure uh, whether he will create a language for his country according to the image of Joyce. He can never be sure how his Czech readers are going to react uh, to his translation of Joyce's injunction to poeticize it with the greatest poetic freedom you can give it. Hofmeister must proceed on the basis of faith that he can create a viable text and an engaged uh, readership in the context of necessary uh, uncertainty. The motivational Force, the third precondition of secular faith uh, is uh, precariousness. Uh, my commitment to the uh, continued life of someone or uh, something 
is inseparable from my sense that it cannot be taken uh, for uh, granted. There has to be a prospective risk of loss for anything to be at stake in sustaining a form of life. This young writer, Hofmeister, travels to Paris to meet his literary hero uh, because like his Polish counterpart in Warsaw, he senses that, so like Gombrowicz, he senses that somewhere over there abroad, a previously unknown method of feeling, of thinking, and of writing has been born. Hofmeister cannot take it for granted that it will be translated or translated in a way that he would approve of, and thus the Czech language and its uh, literature would lose the subversive input of a new way of uh, feeling, thinking, and uh, writing. It is the same motivational force that underlies a, an anthropological commitment uh, to sustaining uh, cultural diversity. The Canadian anthropologist uh, Wade Davies defines the ethnosphere as the sum total of uh, all thoughts and intuitions, uh, myths and beliefs, ideas and inspirations brought into being by human imagination since the dawn of consciousness. A crucial, though not uh, the only element in the expression and sustainability uh, of this atmosphere is human uh, language. Um, yet current estimates are that half of the world's languages will die out in the next two generations. Um, if uh, every uh, language is an old growth forest of the mind, uh, a watershed of thought, an ecosystem of spiritual possibilities, then Davis says uh, we will be witnessing the loss of fully uh, half of humanity's social, cultural, and intellectual legacy. Translation is only possible um, if you have languages to translate uh, from and into. Lose the languages and you lose in interlingual uh, terms the translational possibility of making manifest the social, cultural, and intellectual uh, legacy of ways of understanding and inhabiting uh, the world. It is the very precariousness uh, of the situation of so many of the world's uh, lesser spoken languages, which provides the motivational force for projects to maintain endangered uh, language, even if language loss tends to attract a fraction of the attention of uh, other forms of ecological uh, loss. Uh, it's something is, I, I would just like to say in, in, the, in the context of this as well, which was struck me um, uh, listening to the session before uh, lunch, is the sense in which if you read uh, histories uh, of the modernist uh, revolution of the 20th century, of how people uh, like uh, Beckett, uh, Joyce, and uh, others uh, revolutionized uh, ways of writing uh, in English. Um, there's one extraordinary um, omission uh, in this story, um, which is modern language departments. Um, you can read any history uh, of uh, the modernist revolution in the English language, um, and I will buy you a pint of Guinness in one of my favorite pubs in Dublin if you can come up with a detailed description of the contribution of modern language departments uh, to creating these writers. These were students of modern languages. They were primarily students of modern languages. Uh, we saw uh, before uh, lunch uh, when the, um, Alexander was talking about uh, Mario Dominguez that it was, you know, he acquired his knowledge of English in, in a, a kind of formal uh, educational uh, setting. Um, but these, if you like, um, it's, it's the, the contribution uh, of uh, languages to the kind of tr translation uh, nexus um, to the departments that most of you live, work, and teach in. Um, but how many accounts uh, of revolutionary modernism in Portuguese literature, in French literature, in English literature, in German literature talk about the work of language departments. In other words, we, we do, or we've begun to talk about how translation features uh, in this uh, picture. Uh, but one of the things that we tend not to talk about um, is how uh, foreign language instruction and foreign language departments, who have this kind of strange 
amphibian relationship to the societies that they're in, both inside the societies and outside uh, of the, uh, the societies. Uh, and to some extent, uh, they, they tend to get kind of lost in, in particular kind of descriptions uh, of what you might, um, when people try to draw up a, a picture of the, the genesis of um, particular uh, forms of, of modernism. Because it certainly struck me um, recently preparing uh, a piece of work on the reception of, of Marcel Proust's um, writing um, in, in, in Ireland is that, you know, why Proust is going to have this uh, significant influence on, on Beckett is because, you know, he studied Proust in the French department in Trinity back in, in the late uh, 1920s. And there were so many authors that Joyce got access to in the foreign uh, languages that he was, he was taught uh, by his tutors in University College uh, Dublin. Um, but these are precisely the institutions that get written out of the, uh, the, the picture. So what I would argue is that speculation on, on loss invariably uh, invites us to think about uh, what comes after. Um, would the reception of um, Gustave Flaubert's uh, Madame Bovary uh, in English have been different had the translation that he did with the young uh, English woman, Juliet Herbert, uh, not vanished? Uh, forever, a translation that he collaborated on, uh, but which has now uh, disappeared. Uh, when Benjamin mentions the afterlife uh, in the context uh, of translation, he speaks initially of the triumph of history uh, over nature. The philosopher's task consists in comprehending all of natural life through the more encompassing life of history. And indeed, isn't it the afterlife, afterlife of works of art um, they are far easier to recognize than that uh, of living uh, creatures. What I would argue secular uh, faith uh, points to, on the contrary, is the crucial dependency of history on nature, of works of art on living uh, creatures. Death matters because we have to concern ourselves with someone or something that will live uh, beyond us. As living creatures, we, I quote, we have to take care of one another because we can die. Uh, we have to fight for what we believe in because it only lives through our sustained effort. And we have to be concerned with what will be passed on to future generations uh, because the future is uh, not uh, certain. So the afterlife is always about this life uh, and about what we propose to do and what we care about. Thinking about the afterlife uh, of translation involves us in speculating on the moral imperatives uh, of finite natural life as much as it does on the transmissive life of, of history. Shandor Maroy had um, much reason to reflect uh, on this tension between history and life. His own life and that of his loved ones uh, always ran the risk of falling foul of the uh, ideological forces dominating Hungarian society in the first half of the uh, 20th uh, century. Much to his own surprise, he talks about this on many occasions, he survived uh, the Second World War. Uh, and he found himself in 1946 in a country uh, straining after a semblance uh, of uh, normality. Um, and he even gets uh, news uh, of his translations. Um, a publisher in Barcelona informs me that he has published my work Embers in Spanish. And what he points out is a very beautiful edition. He also writes to tell me, unbeknownst to me, a Spanish translation of Divorce in Buddha has already been published. Reading this news makes me envious. The fortunes of my books are better than mine. Destiny has confined me to a language uh, from, from which, in the depths of my heart and soul, I cannot and will not free myself. I am chained, condemned to grow old like this, sunk in a swamp. My books live their life in Stockholm, Paris, and in Spain. They're getting ready to set off for Latin America, across, traveling across the sparkling ocean, touching the souls of uh, strangers, speaking uh, another language. It's better to be a book than a writer. <laughs> so uh, Maroy feels that once again, he's lost out in this bargain uh, of translation. 
not because he has doubts about the translator at this time, but because he's doubts about the writer, or rather the condition uh, of being a writer. He feels that he is a loser, abandoned, left behind, sunk in a swamp. The gains are all on the side uh, of the translations, traveling across the sparkling uh, oceans, touching the souls of strangers, speaking uh, another language. But the value Maroy places on his itinerant books is driven by a sense of loss. Loss of freedom, loss of income, loss of status in war-torn uh, Hungary. He comes to value what was previously taken uh, for granted. This is why we need, I think, uh, in the words of Vincent uh, de la Croix, to learn to lose. Not in the sense of actively courting failure, but in the sense of learning about loss, what it means and why it matters. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Bishop uh, famously uh, claimed in her poem, uh, One Art, that, and I quote, the art of losing isn't hard to master. Fortunately, translation is there to remind us that nothing could be further from the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for such a stimulating and broad-ranging lecture. Uh, we've got a few minutes for discussion, and this is one case in which I think I'm going to claim the prerogative of the chair and ask a first question, because uh, a lot of what you were saying reminded me, in fact, of uh, two brief passages from two stage plays, both of them, curiously enough, by educators, which I, I, I think also ties in with some of your uh, remarks. The first of them is, I think, rather predictable, almost a commonplace. It involves Hugh, the schoolmaster, in Brian Friel's translation, saying at a certain moment, to remember everything is a form of madness. The other one comes from uh, Tom Stoppard's Arcadia, and it involves a private tutor working uh, at the home of uh, an aristocratic English family at some point between the late 18th and early 19th century, and this private tutor remarks that in our trajectories, I'm not quoting exactly, I'm paraphrasing, uh, I mean both formative and experiential, we can carry only so much, and we have to keep dropping things so that we gain the capacity to pick other things up, you know, that will be enabling, that will allow us to, uh, to move on. A and I think your argument on how integral translation is to loss, its inevitability and its necessity, do you think it gives us a sort of renewed basis on which to claim a sort of co-extension, a very ambitious one, between translation and culture, culture construed as the shape taken by our lives at any one moment. Can we use your argument in order to be as ambitious as that? Yeah, no, that's a very, very interesting uh, comment, um, question, Hui. I think, uh, I think one way of, of, of looking at it, one of my, my other sort of core uh, preoccupations uh, over the years has been this question of, of, of travel and mobility and, and, and movement. Uh, and of course, one of the, the, the most basic things that you, one says um, about travel and, and mobility is that it, it, it involves a kind of um, a loss, a kind of, you know, as you move, um, in order to be able to move in a particular way, uh, you have to kind of shed a lot of things in order to allow the mobility to happen because otherwise, if there are too many things, uh, you get simply immobilized by this kind of uh, materiality. So, well, snowed down. Yeah, you get snowed down. And to some extent, if, if any of you have seen this, this, this wonderful calendar uh, that I think was produced by either Oxfam or, or Amnesty, where they ask people in different parts of the, of the world to empty out the contents uh, of their dwelling places. Um, and you see uh, in certain parts of the world um, where there's a small scattering of belongings outside the dwelling place. And, and by the time you get to our parts of the world and to North America, uh, there's this phenomenal oceanic spread of objects uh, in front of the houses. And, and there's a sense in which, in an ecological sense, we're, we're, we're getting immobilized in a kind of toxic sense by, these, uh, by this kind of material. But so this notion of kind of the shedding that's involved in, 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 in mobility, uh, and, and that mobility is uh, often 
uh, bound up with this sense of innovation and, and, and renewal, why, which is why it's both celebrated and feared, uh, dreaded and adulated uh, at the, the, the same time. I think that there's something in, in translation itself that, that kind of the, 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 the mobility, you know, um, where there, there's a kind of, of, of shedding, uh, which is, you know, where loss gets negatively uh, connoted. Um, whereas I think you can see loss in, uh, from the, the, in a kind of nomadic sense, the kind of nomadology uh, of translation uh, as something that is deeply enabling uh, rather than something that's seen as characteristically uh, disabling in, in particular ways. Um, Thank you very yeah. much. Now, let's open the discussion to the floor. And uh, before we start taking your questions, can I please ask you, if possible, without wanting to curtail you, to be as direct and concise in your questions as you can? Uh, Karen, I'm not, I'm please. Like the lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. My suggestion is that there's some sort of a reaction going on because it's in the course of the 20th century that the city splits. And today okay. we're seeing the, the, um, uh, the result of this in this kind of epistemological divide between English and literary scholars about what translation is all about. Okay, so thanks. I, I Michael. Yeah. Um, no, no, I think that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, inter intervention, uh, Karen, in terms of, well, I mean, when I think of the, the, the role of, of modern language departments, you see, on, on the one hand, there is this kind of sense in which uh, when translation does turn up in these modern language departments, it's basically kind of replication of the classical paradigm, that, that, that it becomes uh, part of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a language acquisition uh, exercise. So, you know, the way in which ten uh, version or kind of the, uh, the translation into and out of the classical language was used to, to acquire the classical language. This then is, is, is brought into um, the uh, to, to modern language departments themselves. But what, what interests me is the way in which um, writers uh, like you know um, Beckett and 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 and, and, and Joyce uh, and, and others um, they. They, they, they're, they're exposed to this, right? They're, they're, they're kind of aware of this particular kind of um, paradigm. Um, but yet what they take from their exposure 
uh, to literature in, 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 the, in the other language is that they're going to develop a different kind of translational paradigm, and the translational paradigm is going to be a transformative one rather than um, a one of um, kind of servile uh, f f f fidelity. Right? Um, so it's the... Uh, and I think this is where, to some extent, the kind of the, uh, the creative practices of the writers themselves um, are kind of are situated in, in some kind of, of, of third space or entre deux or whatever, you know, between the, the, the two kinds of um, models that you're, 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 you're describing. Um, but what none that, and it, it is certainly true that um, the, a certain kind of pushback uh, against uh, what the role of these departments might have been uh, is, is to do with the, the legacy that you're talking about. Um, but the omission is so stark and is so startling, uh, and it means that the, uh, the description then of the genesis of these writers is so radically incomplete um, that you, um, you know, it means you fail to understand very significant shifts in, 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 in modernist developments. I mean, w one of the classic ones I always think is around the question of translation. Uh, Marcel Proust. Um, he was, uh, uh, the Irish couldn't wait to ban him. Um, and once we set up the, uh, the censorship board in 1929, so that's uh, seven years after independence, uh, he was one of the first people to you know, uh, get the call from the censorship. And, but, so the translations were, were, were banned. But there were students all over the country uh, during that period and for decades afterwards, they were reading Proust in French in French departments. And many of those people went on to become significant uh, contributors uh, to uh, the modernist uh, movement in, in literature. Um, and that's just one, t one small example. There are many, many others. Uh, but uh, I've, I've gone through uh, so many of these different histories um, and you'll get one line. Um, Joyce studied uh, French and Italian in University College Dublin. Uh, Samuel Beckett um, did French and Italian, and he was very good, and he got top marks, and that's it, you know, end of story. Um, so, it's, uh, so it is a complex uh, legacy, but I, I, I find the, 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 the omission startling. Mm -hmm. Other, que Other questions? Yeah, yeah Teresa. Ibsen, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and then uh, he writes in Italian when he's in Italy, but he also teaches English as a foreign language to uh, Italian students. So he's very much the, the, the wonderful example, I think, that breaks through any idea of modernism as monolingual uh, in any way, and rather, uh, as you were saying, really reclaims for the notion of these <laughs> existence of languages and, and the idea of um, uh, the, the, the foreign aspects of. Yeah, just, just, just very, very quickly, I, I think there's a, a wonderful book by a man called uh, Paul Fussell called uh, Abroad British Literary Travelling uh, Between the Two World Wars. And uh, you know, he, he talks a lot about, um, you know, again, this. This notion of you know uh, mobility and loss, that that that, that figure of displacement, um, which you know, and the exilic is often seen in in, in, in highly negative terms under the sign of of loss. But you know what he argues is that it's it's constitutive. You know, it's it's um, it is something that is kind of foundational in terms of how how, how modernity evolves. Thank you. We've got a question from Tal.
instance, you look at Bible translations, what was unusable um, in, in the Septuaginta is not the same unusable as the Vulgata, the Kimchinis. Um, um, so, so I think this notion helps us to, to actually think something very central in translation, even in terms of norms. What are the norms of nonsense? Yeah, no, I think that could, the, the just take the second part of uh, uh, of your 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 your, your question. Uh, it's precisely, it seems to me, this this notion of of the finite, of 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 the mortal, and so on, which makes the that condition, the notion of loss, you know, uh, inescapably. Uh, historical, inescapably uh, redefined constantly, you know, because it's it's a loss against against what, you know, what, you know, how are you defining it, and this of course uh, changes uh, through time. I think this kind of notion of of, of loss uh, aversion, um, I think one of the reasons in in translation that it, it becomes so problematic is that, that we feel, and this is, you know, why Venuti is so exercised uh, uh, about it, is that he feels we, we, we become prisoners of cliché, you know, that the, uh, the, the standard response of the ignorant is to say, uh, well, of course, you know, poetry is what gets lost in translation. It's you know, so it, it is this glib after-dinner phrase, uh, and you just despair, you know, you want to fall to your knees, you know, and weep. Um, uh, and it, so this means that we then don't, um, we, we kind of, when we, 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 we react against it, it's to kind of dismiss it. It's just, uh, you know, it's, it's the epiphenomenon of an abyss of ignorance. Um, whereas I think that to some extent um, it would be more useful for us to, to actually to take this, it's, you know, it's one of the best ways of, of, of dealing with your enemies is to <laughs> enter the enemy territory, take their, and then say, okay, yeah, we're losers. And I'm going to tell you why this is a good thing, and that we're so. So I, I think it's it's. Um, I think the reluctance to, to, to maybe think more deeply about. Uh, I know you've done this in some of your own work, but the the, the reluctance to think about loss is that kind of epidermal uh, reaction to rejection. Thank you. Is that one final quick question? If not, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, George. Well, oh, well, absolutely. You know, I, I think that the, I, I, the next time that I'm in contact with TAP, I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I, I quote my eminent colleague from Coimbra <laughs> in defense of their policy. In terms, of what, <laughs> in terms of what we can gain from you, can we expect from you at any point soon then a literary history of language education? I mean, are you treating yourself to that pint at your familiar pub? Uh, well, <laughs> uh, well to, to, I, this is certainly one of the things that I'm, I'm thinking about, but what I'm working on at present is something uh, quite, well, it is related. It's, it's, it's a book on what I call the, the terrestrial uh, university, which is, um, you know, given the nature and scale of the, 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 the climate catastrophe, um, one of my deep feelings is that our universities are... Uh, catastrophically no longer fit for purpose. Um, I think we need to radically uh, rethink the way uh, that we, uh, we conduct uh, education, um, how we do it, uh, what we teach, how we organize our universities, how our universities are physically integrated uh, into their uh, in environment. Um, so, uh, and I don't mean by this kind of the greenwashing, you know, I mean by having a couple of bins and that's it, you've just turned yourself into a green sustainable university. I'm talking about a really deep 
uh, rethink about the kinds of bodies of, 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 of knowledge and that, 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 that we need. I mean, I, I was saying in another conference, I would lo I'd love to see you know, a faculty of air, a faculty of water, uh, a faculty of fire, uh, a faculty of, of, of earth. Um, of course, most people would probably send me into the faculty of, of hot air. Um, where, uh, but the, uh, but I, I just... Hmm. Yeah, and uh, uh, Mélenchon in the, in the French political scene has been talking about this Université de la Mer, so um, although, again, I think I make a distinction between what they, what they mean by university is they're going to have a you know, marine biology section, and, but uh, you know, I, I think that if you're going to really reconfigure this, um, uh, what about the more than human world? Um, how do we integrate the more than human world into this lecture theatre? Um, all of us here, uh, the reason that we're alive is because of the activity of plants. But how many plants do we see in this lecture theatre? Where are they? Uh, you know, uh, all of these vital uh, systems that are on the verge of collapse because we have educational systems that blind us uh, to their importance and to their existence and how they contribute. Um, so this is kind of uh, the, the, I suppose, the, the, the project that's, that's uh, closest to. But the one about the um, university uh, language departments is, is, is there in, in, in all right. as well. Somewhere. We'll all be looking forward to that. Again, Michael, thank you very much for such a fabulous lecture. Thank you.